I'm Susan Chabinski with Morningstar. Every Monday morning, I sit down with Morningstar Research Services Chief U.S. Market Strategist Dave Sequeira to discuss what's on his radar this week, some new Morningstar research, and a few stock picks or pans for the week ahead. So good morning, Dave. On the earnings radar this week, we have a few overvalued technology names reporting, stocks that look priced to perfection from our perspective. The first is CrowdStrike, which is ticker CRWD. Uh, we've talked about this cybersecurity mm-hmm. play on the show before, and the stock has really shot up since then. Good morning, Susan. Yeah, we actually first recommended CrowdStrike uh, on our show back on February 6, 2023. At that point in time, you know, the stock was a four-star rated stock. Since then, it looks like that stock is up 188%, and that now puts it into two-star territory. So I still like the long-term fundamentals of the cybersecurity industry. I still see a lot of positive aspects to it. But like many of the stocks in the cybersecurity space, you know, it's just risen, you know, too far, too fast, according to our valuations. You know, in fact, you know, if you look at some of the comparables here, like Zscaler reported last week, you know, that was a two-star rated stock going into earnings, you know, that dropped 10%. The week before that was Palo Alto, that also was a two-star rated stock when it went into earnings. You know, that one I think dropped around 25% after its earnings report. So, you know, in this case, you know, I probably think there's more downside risk here than there is upside potential. Got it. So then there's also Broadcom reporting this week. That's Mm -hmm. ticker AVGO. And that's another richly priced tech stock that's rallied substantially over the past Mm -hmm. year, riding that AI wave of investor interest. Yeah, again, you know, when we look at these stocks, you know, a year ago, a lot of them were very undervalued. You know, this one was a four star rated stock in December of 2022. It's up 150% since then. So that's actually not a one star rated stock it trades at a 44% premium to our fair value. Now, we do expect the AI will be a material driver of their business. You know, applications like the large language models, you know, do require advanced network switching. And we think Broadcom's chips are probably best of breed for that. We do take that into account in our financial assumptions and our projections. But, you know, when we look at this, you know, since December 2022, we've increased our fair value by 55% as well. We're up to $970 a share from 624. But I think the takeaway here is, again, the stock has just risen, you know, too much, too far. Now, Oracle, which is ticker ORCL, also looks overpriced. But in this case, the stock hasn't shut out the lights by any stretch. Yeah, but even so, it's still a two-star rated stock, trades at a 35% premium to our fair value. Now, it is a company we do rate with a narrow economic moat. We do think it's one of the best providers for, you know, database technology as well as ERP. And when I take a look at our forecast here, you know, we're forecasting a five-year revenue compound annual growth rate of 8%. We're still looking for operating margins to expand from 36% uh, in 2028. Oh, I'm sorry, looking to expand to 36% in 2028 from 28% uh, in 2023. But essentially, you know, it just looks like the market is expecting you know, even more growth than what we're currently projecting. And we do think that cloud competition will probably provide additional headwinds, you know, in the future. Uh, specifically, you know, reading the research here from Julie, who covers the stock for us, yeah, you know, she's concerned that Oracle, you know, might be losing market share in court uh, against you know other new database types that might be better suited to the cloud business. So, Dave, are there any under the radar names reporting this week where there might be an opportunity mm-hmm. for investors? You know, the other one I'm actually going to be watching myself is going to be Brown Foreman. Uh, that ticker is at BF.B. Now, that stock, when I look at it and look at the historical charts here, it rose too high in 2020. And it went up to two stars, but it's been on a pretty strong longward downtrend you know, since then. But it does look like it may have bottomed out here in January uh, at a four star reading, uh, four star rating. Now, it has bounced. Uh, it's now a three star rated stock and it's only a four percent discount. But I do think this might still be an opportunity to buy a pretty high quality name that when you look at it, rarely trades you know, much below our fair value estimate. Now, I'm not a Jack Daniels guy myself, but they do have the best selling American whiskey brand in the world. It's a company we rate with a wide economic moat and a medium uncertainty. And the company has been successful in expanding into both premium as well as super premium segments, as well as into the faster growing ready to drink category. So also this week, we have Fed Chairman Powell speaking before Congress Mm -hmm. over a couple of days this week. And investors will, of course, be listening. What will you be listening for? 
Yeah, so he's speaking both Wednesday and Thursday at the semi-annual monetary policy report to Congress. And there's really three areas, I think, to focus in on. So first is going to be inflation expectations. You know, I'd like to hear some more details on what the Fed you know, wants to see before they start to begin the lowering the federal funds rate. You know, when I look at our numbers here, you know, the Morningstar economic team is still very comfortable with their projection that the rate of inflation, you know, is going to continue to keep slowing, you know, over the next couple months and actually through the rest of this year and into next. Uh, second, I want to hear, you know, his view on the economy. The economy actually has been holding up, you know, better than expected, even better than what we've expected. In fact, we just bumped, you know, our 2024 GDP forecast to 2% from 1.8%. So again, you know, how long can the economy continue to keep performing you know, better than expected in face of what we consider to be restrictive monetary policy? And then lastly, you know, any commentary he might have on the soundness of the regional banks in light of their commercial real estate exposure. So, for example, you know, here in early February, New York Community Bank you know, did announce some big hits in its commercial real estate exposure. Uh, the Bank is actually back in the news again. They announced some problems with their internal controls. You know, they replaced their CEO. So that stock, you know, it did sell off last week. And I also noticed that it did send the bonds tumbling down as well. And then the last thing on your radar this week, Dave, is the non-farm payroll number that's coming out on Friday. What's this number indicate and why is it worth watching? Now, it's worth watching because depending on where it comes out, it could move the markets, you know, up or down. But really, I'm looking at it as an indication of the strength of an employment, you know, an indication of economic performance. But really, more importantly, I think the market is looking at it as an indication for the outlook for wage growth. So again, if we have too tight of a labor market, you know, that could lead to high wage growth. And again, while that's good for those individuals that can get paid more, it is bad for our outlook for inflation. The concern there would be if we do have too tight of a labor market, you know, that could potentially lead to more of like a wage price inflation spiral. Got it. So moving on to some new research from Morningstar, and we've got a lot of ground to cover mm -hmm. on th this front this week. Uh, let's start with Snowflake, which is ticker SNOW, which is a stock we've talked about before on the show as an AI play. Last week, Snowflake reported earnings, provided an updated forecast, and announced its CEO is leaving. It's a lot of news, Dave. Recap it for us. <laughs> Well, and I got to admit, yeah, I was very disappointed by the earnings release and the news here. So if you remember, we actually recommended this stock on one of our shows in October of 2023. I think the stock at that point in time was you know, $150 and change. We thought this was going to be a good second derivative play on artificial intelligence. The stock did trade up, got over, I think, just $230 a share. And that put it you know, right about at our fair value you know, just prior to earnings. Now, following earnings, we did cut our fair value by about 20% down to $187 a share, which is where about the stock is trading right now. So I guess the good news is, you know, if it did buy back in the 150 range, you know, it's still up on the trade. But this is just a really messy situation. You know, the company did provide, you know, revenue and margin guidance, you know, below what the market expected and what we expected. And even worse, they also pulled their long term guidance. So what what changed from our perspective? Was it was mm -hmm. it sort of that news of pulling the guidance? Um, did the surprise departure of the CEO play mm -hmm. a part? What 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 contributed to the change? Yeah, so I pulled up our financial model that we had, you know, both before as well as after, you know, the earnings release. And really the things that lowered the fair value the most is we did lower our long term revenue growth rate down to 23 percent from 34 percent previously. And then we also pushed back our operating margin expansion uh, expectations. So we're only forecasting you know, a 1.1% operating margin in 2028. That's down from 6.4% you know, beforehand. So when I think about the situation now, what I'm really trying to figure out is, you know, is the company just using this quarter, using the management change is really kind of a, an opportunity to lower their guidance for the company, kind of kitchen sinking it this quarter to make it easier for the new management team to outperform going forward? Or is this really more indicative of some deteriorating you know, underlying fundamentals? And after talking to our team, we think it's actually more the latter. Mm. So what do you think about the surprise departure of the CEO? Mm. I mean, it seems like it did catch everybody off guard, right? You know, there's really not much to say here. It's just never a good sign when you have an unplanned replacement of the CEO. So let's pivot over to some other new research, and that's Morningstar economist Preston Caldwell's new forecasts. He's made mm -hmm. some tweaks. First, he, and you mentioned this earlier, he bumped up his GDP forecast for 2024, and then he ratcheted back 
expectations for 2025 and 2026. So what do the reforecasted numbers look like and why the change? Yeah, again, you know, the economy has still been holding up better than expected. I think the economic indicators we've seen here in January and February you know, are looking actually, you know, pretty good. I mean, not ridiculously strong, but enough that, you know, we did increase our GDP forecast for the full year up to 2% from 1.8%. But as you mentioned, he then actually lowered his expectation for 2025 and 2026. So we're currently looking for 1.5% GDP growth in 2025 and 2.6% growth in 2026. So that's a slight decrease from 1.7% and 2.8% respectively. So I think when I'm looking at these lower long-term forecasts and reading through Preston's research, I think essentially what he's doing here is he's really just accounting for the delayed impact to the demand side of the economy from the currently restrictive monetary policy. Now, looking at his inflation forecast, it doesn't seem like that one changed that much. Morningstar is still looking for inflation to fall back to the Fed's mm -hmm. 2% target in 2024. How do Morningstar's inflation expectations differ from that of the markets? Yeah, you know, it's lower than what the market is expecting. So if you look at the consensus expectations right now for inflation, they are looking for it to stay higher. So the market, I think, is at about 2.4% right now versus our 2% forecast. And then finally, let's talk about Morningstar's interest rate expectations. Uh, here, we're still looking for interest rate cuts this year, but we've mm -hmm. pushed those rate cuts back to May or June from March. So update viewers on our interest rate expectations for 2024 and beyond. Yeah, and whether it's you know the May meeting or the June meeting that the Fed does start to cut the federal funds rate, we do forecast that once they begin to cut, they're going to cut at every single meeting you know thereafter for the rest of the year. So what that means is if they start cutting at the May meeting, we would expect the fund federal funds rate at the end of the year to be in that three and three quarter to four percent range. But if they don't start cutting until the meeting thereafter, it means at the end of the year we'd be in that four to four and a quarter percent range. But I would also note that we did reduce you know how much we expect our long-term interest rates to subside over the course of this year. So we had expected the 10-year U.S. Treasury to average 3.5%. Uh, we do expect it now to average 3.5% this year and 2.75% uh, and next year. Uh, you know what? I'm actually looking at my numbers here wrong, Susan. So let me kind of uh, reduce, restate that. So we have reduced our forecast uh, for the long-term rates. We had expected the 10 year to average three and a half this year and two and three quarter next year. That new forecast now is for 4% this year and 3% next year. So sorry about that. That's all right. So then based on our economic, updated economic and inflation forecasts and current mm -hmm. uh, stock market valuations, what's Morningstar think of the market today? Yes, yeah, so we actually just published our regular monthly outlook, and that is available now on Morningstar.com. So the broad U.S. market right now is trading only a couple percent above our fair value. So in my mind, it doesn't put us into that overvalued territory just yet. But when I do look at the market and the charts, I do think the market is starting to feel a little stretched here in the short term. And historically, if you look at the market valuation compared to our valuation, you know, since the end of 2010, it's only traded at this much of a premium or more 25% of the time. Now, we do break our valuation down a couple of ways, both by the Morningstar style box as well as by sector. So I'd note at this point, we do think core and growth categories, which of course, you know, have surged higher last year and this year are now trading you know, at premiums. They're trading at three and 4% premiums over our fair value. And uh, the value category you know, has lagged last year. It's still lagging a bit this year, but according to our numbers, that's still trading at a 9% uh, undervaluation compared to where we think it should be. Then looking by capitalization, large caps have done very well this year. Those are overvalued. Uh, we still like mid cap and small cap, especially the small cap space where that's trading at a 19% discount to fair value. And then by sector, uh, both technology and industrials trading at 8% premiums to fair value. So putting those in the overvalued category. Consumer defensive also now starting to get kind of pricey trading at a 5% premium. And then where we see value is still communications, still the most undervalued sector at a 12% discount. That's followed then by real estate at an 11% discount, and then by utilities at a 10% discount. So Dave, when the market trades at, you, you referred to at fair value, what mm -hmm. might long-term investors expect in terms of market returns ahead? So for the longer term investors, it means that over time, I would expect to be able to earn you know, the weighted average cost of equity of the market you know, over time. 
Now, of course, there's always going to be a lot of volatility, you know, both to the upside as well as to the downside. But if you hold through that volatility over the longer term, I would expect to get, you know, eight to nine percent type of returns. But of course, you know, it's those periods of you know volatility when the market is either overvalued or undervalued that you can manage, you know, the exposure of your portfolio, you know, either above or below kind of what your target rates are to try and take advantage of that natural market volatility to try and add, you know, some additional upside. So in your March stock market outlook, you say that now is a good time to begin to invest mm -hmm. in contrarian plays, but you say that's not just for the sake of being a contrarian. So unpack mm -hmm. that for us. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'm a little on the early side, you know, to this one at this point, but based on our valuations, I do think now's a good time, you know, to start breaking away from the herd. And just to give you a bit of background, you know, thinking about, you know, the trend that we've had, you know, for the past, you know, 15 to 16 months, you know, in our 2023 outlook, you know, we did note that both, you know, growth stocks as well as technology stocks were very undervalued. In fact, technology was one of the most undervalued sectors at that point in time. And then also coming into 2023, when you look at the MAG-7 stocks, you know, six of those seven were either four or five star rated stocks. Now, since then, you know, the growth category is up, tech's up even more. And when we look at those MAG-7 stocks, you know, three of them are now overvalued, three are fairly valued, and only Alphabet is undervalued. Taking a look at it by, you know, growth, the growth category is at a 3% premium and tech's at an 8% premium. So while not the most overvalued, you know, each of those has traded, I do think it's a good time to take some profits, you know, in those areas. Of course, the question is, if you take profits, well, then what do you do? You know, where do you put that money? So I started looking for, you know, some of those areas, you know, some of those stocks specifically, you know, that have underperformed, you know, this market rally are currently unloved by the market and are, in our view, undervalued. So we looked across you know, all of those sectors and stocks and essentially you know, tried to find you know, where have they you know, lagged the broad market to the upside? Where do we see a lot of negative market sentiment? And you know, which ones are now trading at a good margin of safety from their intrinsic valuation? So let's talk about, you know, in your outlook, you outline three good places for investors to look for these contrarian plays. As you say, these places are all underperforming, unloved and undervalued. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is real estate. Recap what's been going on in the sector and why you like it. Yeah, commercial real estate has got to be probably the most hated asset class, you know, across the street, you know, right now. I mean, first, there is still a huge amount of uncertainty regarding valuations for urban office space. You know, and secondly, real estate has been adversely affected by the increase of interest rates you know, over time. And both of those have brought valuations down across the entire real estate sector. So, in fact, the real estate index did drop 25% in 2022. It only rose you know, 2% last year, and it's actually down again you know, 2% this year. So personally, I'd still steer clear of urban office space, but other areas we do think have gotten pulled down with that urban office space you know, too much especially those real estate sectors that we think have more defensive type of you know, characteristics. And then lastly, I would note the Morningstar U.S. economic team does project interest rates will decline you know, later this year. In fact, we're looking for the entire yield curve to decline you know, over the course of this year and next. And I think those declining interest rates would then provide a good tailwind for the real estate sector. Now, you also suggest investor, investors look for contrarian ideas in the utility sector. Why? Mm -hmm. And it's just a combination of you know, three things. One, valuation, two, fundamentals, and three, interest rate expectations. Now, utilities were only up 1.6% in 2022. They were down 7% last year in 2023, and now they're down again you know, over 2% year to date. So that puts the sector now at a 10% discount you know, to our fair values. And fundamentally, when you talk to our equity analysts there, you know, they think the utility space is actually as strong as that they've ever seen it. You know, they see a long runway of growth here for the transition into renewable energy. Yeah, you know, we're seeing a lot of government investment in the electrical grid infrastructure. So that should all provide, you know, some pretty good growth for the utility space, you know, over the next couple of years. Plus, we do think that, you know, the tailwind behind declining interest rates will be positive for them over the next few years. And your last contrarian sector is energy. Explain the dynamics of what's been going on there and why it's undervalued. Yeah, so when I look at energy and look at our oil and gas stocks, you know, what's embedded in our models is that we project oil demand, you know, should peak later this decade and then start to gradually decline thereafter. We also project a mid-cycle oil price of $55 a barrel for West Texas. So again, you know, we're not looking for, you know, really a lot of upside here from a fundamental perspective. 
But even based on those assumptions, you know, the energy sector is trading at a large discount to fair value. So the downside here would be, you know, if demand falls faster than what we currently expect. However, I don't think that we're actually being, you know, all that aggressive. I think we're actually probably one of the more conservative forecasts on the street for demand. And of course, the other downside would be if oil prices were to fall more than what we're currently projecting. Now, to the upside, you know, if those assumptions that we currently have in our models do come to fruition, you know, energy is one of the more undervalued parts of the market today. And of course, if oil prices, you know, stay here higher or if demand, you know, is, you know, better than what we expected, I think there's a lot of upside leverage here. And then lastly, I do think the energy stocks could also benefit if we see a rotation into value stocks, higher demand for higher dividend paying stocks. And then lastly, I do think that energy also acts as just a good natural hedge in your portfolio, not only for inflation, but for any other additional geopolitical risk. So let's move on to the picks portion of our program. You've brought viewers three stocks to sell and three stocks to buy based on your March stock market outlook. So heading into March, as you mentioned earlier, growth stocks are overvalued and tech stocks are even more overvalued. So your stocks to sell are all pricey tech or tech related stocks. The first stock to sell is Meta. Wide economic moat for this company recently announced it'll begin paying a dividend, yet it's a sell. Why? Yeah. So I think, you know, Meta is really kind of emblematic of the market performance that we've seen since the market bottomed out at the end of October 2022. I mean, back then, I mean, you almost couldn't give that stock away. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a five star rated stock at that point. It was trading at a 60 percent discount to fair value. And that's got, that stock has now skyrocketed, I think, about 400 percent since then. And it's not like we stood still. We actually increased our fair value over 50% over that same time period as well. So just like the pendulum swung too far to the downside back then, we just think the pendulum is now swinging you know, too far to the upside. And lest you think our forecast might be overly conservative, you know, when I pull up our model here, yeah, you know, we are projecting revenue to grow at a compound annual growth rate of over 10% over the next five years. We are looking for the operating margin to expand, you know, from 35% last year all the way up to 41% by 2028. So essentially, you know, earnings of 1770 this year growing all the way to 2836 in 2028. And those assumptions, you know, still put us in that two-star category as the stock trades at a 26% premium to that intrinsic valuation. Wow. Now, you also think Arm is a stock to sell. Now, Arm went public last fall, and the stock has really mm -hmm. shot up since then. And SoftBank still owns about 90% of the company, and that lockup period is ending soon. So it just sounds like there might be some red flags around this stock right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I mean, according to our equity research team, Arm is actually probably one of the most overvalued stocks mm -hmm. under our coverage right now. So as you mentioned, it did go public last September. That stock is up 123% since then. But as you mentioned, you know, only 10% of the company was sold publicly at that, at that point. So the other 90% is still in private hands. So you have to think about you know, the technicals there. So that current valuation is really only based on 10% of the company trading in the public markets. Now, it uh, looks like that lockup period you know, ends here maybe in mid-March. So we could see a lot of that locked up you know, supply you know, come into the markets. And that added supply you know, could you know, provide some price pressure to that stock. Now, taking a look at our model here, revenue, we expect a five-year compound annual growth rate of 18%. So essentially, we'd be looking for revenue to go from $2.7 billion in 2023 up to $6.2 billion by 2028. We're looking for the current operating margin of 25.2% in 2023 to go all the way up to over 40% in 2028. So right now our earnings per share is $1.14 this year. So that puts the company now at 125 times, you know, this earnings report. And at two point or two dollars and fifty-six cents of earnings you know, in 2028, according to our forecast, you're still paying you know, 55 times, you know, five-year forward earnings at this point on that stock. And then the last overvalued stock to sell is Palantir. Uh, the stock mm -hmm. looked really cheap a while ago, but has completely shot out the lights during this past year. Again, riding that AI wave. Talk about it. Yeah, and Palantir has just been a very highly stock, highly volatile stock over the last couple of years. You know, originally it was one of those disruptive tech stock plays. You know, it shot up in 2020. 
I think the stock peaked in 2021. It was well in one star territory. Since then, it's dropped, you know, over 80%, putting it down into five star territory. It then bottomed out at the end of 2022. Looks like it was trading with a six handle back then. And now it's back up to $25 a share. So it's currently rated, you know, two stars. Taking a look at our model here, we do forecast you know, a pretty high revenue growth rate. We're looking for a compound annual growth rate of 21% over the next five years. So to put that in context, you know, we're modeling revenue to go from 2.2 billion in 2023 up to 5.7 billion in 2028. We're looking for operating margins to double. So essentially we're going to look at, you know, forecasted earnings of 33 cents a share here in 2024, going up to over 60 cents, you know, by 2028. So if you're buying that stock today, you're paying you know, 75 times you know, this year earnings and 40 times 2028 earnings. Well, so let's move on to some stocks to buy instead. Uh, you have three mm -hmm. contrarian stock ideas for investors in March, one from each of the out of favor sectors we talked about earlier in the show. Your first pick is from the real estate sector. It's Avalon Bay Communities. Tell, tell viewers about it. Yeah, so Avalon Bay, you know, focuses on owning large, high quality properties, it has a portfolio of, you know, 281 apartment communities, over 87,000 units. They're also currently developing, you know, 18 additional properties with another 6,000 units. So again, you know, that multifamily space has been under, you know, intense pressure. Yeah, you know, we did see, you know, New York Community Bank, you know, take significant hits there. Uh, they did call out their multifamily exposure there as well. But I do think that what happened with New York Community Bank is different than what we're going to see with Avalon Bay. So our REIT team actually did recently you know, sharpen their pencils. They took a fresh look at our entire real estate coverage here. You know, they did lower their fair value on Avalon Bay a little bit under 9% to 213 a share from 233. But you know, even after lowering our fair value there, it's still a four-star rated stock trading at 16% discount uh, and has a 3.8% dividend yield. Now, your second contrarian stock pick is utility. It's Duke Energy, pretty big mm -hmm. player among electric utilities, has a pretty good looking dividend yield, too. Yeah, the dividend yield there is four and a half percent. Stock's currently a four star rated stock, trades at a 19 percent discount. And, you know, a lot of things to like here. You, you know, we do rate the company with a narrow economic moat, does have a low uncertainty rating. So I think, you know, the question here is, you know, why do we think this is a contrarian play? And in our view, we just don't think the market doesn't really fully appreciate, you know, the constructive regulatory environments that Duke operates in. And we think that Duke just has a long runway of growth opportunities in its regulated businesses. And so right now we think it's actually one of the most undervalued utilities under our coverage. And then your final stock pick this week is from the energy sector. It's APA. It's a name we've talked about before on the show. Remind viewers why you mm -hmm. like it as a contrarian play. Yeah, so it's a five-star rated stock, trades, I think, just over a 50% discount to our intrinsic valuation. Company has a 3.3% dividend yield. Now, it is a company we do rate with no economic moat, but I'm really looking at this one as a catalyst-driven situation. So APA does have a joint venture with Total in Suriname, and it seems like you know, the evidence here points to potentially a very large oil play you know, that's kind of in discovery stages right now. And we do think it's very likely that, you know, at least one or more of these discoveries will progress then to the development stage. So I do have to caution people, you know, none of these have been you know, officially sanctioned, you know, by the companies just yet. The final investment decision on whether or not they're going to move forward and develop these plays, you know, won't be until towards the end of this year. But if they do move forward, you know, our energy team thinks that, you know, the first oil production could begin in 2028. And according to Stephen Ellis, that would just be a, a game changer for this company that could double the company's production over the course of the next 10 years. Yet, according to our valuations, it doesn't seem like the market has included you know, this probability you know, into the stock price just yet. So at this point, it actually kind of looks like a free option to us. Hmm. Well, thanks for your time this morning, Dave. Viewers interested in researching any of the stocks that Dave talked about today can visit Morningstar.com for more analysis. We hope you'll join us again next Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Central. In the meantime, please like this video and subscribe to Morningstar's channel. Have a great week.